Okay, can you hear me at the back? <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you so much, Praveen and Jaya, for being here today. Diversity, equity, and inclusion has gained significant importance, um, especially in, um, uh, in GCCs today. In fact, one of the things um, I was reading about uh, DEI and GCCs, just preparing for this session, and I, I realized that some of the most progressive policies and programs have come from GCCs. And uh, kudos to all of you all here who are making that happen as business leaders. Volatile markets, uncertainty, and cost-challenging environments often put us in a back foot with DEI. This is a practice we've often seen even in the past. Even during the pandemic, we've had instances where DEI took a back seat till we realized the importance of mental health and well-being and the importance of safety in the workplace. And so today we have uh, Praveen and Jaya talking to us about this wonderful and most important topic. Okay, so let's go ahead. Should I start with you, Jaya? No. So um, Jaya is a global leader who's been in the DEI space for more than a decade. You have seen many economic and market highs and lows. And of late, the pandemic situation, which often impacts investments and continuity of DEI. In your experience, what do you think are the key challenges organizations face in sustaining DEI efforts during economic time, difficult economic times, and how can these challenges be overcome? Thank you. It's great to be here. And I want to take a pause and just talk about, you know, the last couple of years. If you look at DE&I as a hot topic of conversation, and if you look at all the events that have taken place, so let's talk about the movements. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the racial injustice movement. Let's talk about the gender equality activism. Let's talk about LGBT plus employees and you know, around the world, the activism for more equal society. Let's talk about India, where same-sex partner marriages, there's already a petition that's going to be, you know, there's going to be a finality on that petition really soon. That's just one aspect. Let's talk about also the fact that today you have uh, investors, you have senior executive leaders, and 83% of them are willing to pay 10% higher for companies that they want to acquire who have an ESG you know, focus. Let's talk about your job seeker. 39% of job seekers will say no to an organization purely on the perception or the lack of inclusion that they're probably understanding of the organization they wanted to join. So overall, d &I is a very front and center conversation. And I think today, the commitments that organizations have made over the years, and I understand that not everybody here listening to me is at the same stage of the investment you've made in d &I. But I would say that if you have made a commitment to d &I, you need to consistently be accountable to remove any inequities that exist in your system. And I'm talking about hire to retire. Whatever that commitment you made, follow through with it. As an example, we've put in guardrails for any inequities in the system. And I'll take pay parity. We did a one-time correction of any unintended pay inequities, and this was four years ago. If you look at the very, very hot topic of generative AI. How are you looking at the impact within your organization? Future skills, the diversity that actually exists within your organization for those future skills. And I think just the third piece is today, all of my research internally, and we have a really large organization where about 74,000 people across 11 countries very clearly tell us that if you have a lack of personal support, 
your organization is the one that can play a very significant role in you keeping one foot at work. So the support that an organization offers and has offered in the last three years, that will continue to heighten. We have to be able to commit to all of these. Thank you, Jaya. That was wonderful. Whether it's your ESG strategy, whether it's your employer brand, whether it's about building diverse products, whether it's about catering to diverse stakeholders and investors, DEI plays a very, very critical role. Um, moving on to you, Praveen. In the recent Gartner 2023 Board of Directors survey, which included 281 board directors and members of various boards across industries and geographies, there were three priorities. Digital acceleration, sustainability, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this is in 2023. As a global technology company, how do you prioritize DEI during these uncertain times? And what value do you think it brings to your business, your strategy, and your employees? Thank you. It's, it's really an honor to be in the NASCOM event. It's my first time, so excited. Uh, I like to first start sharing with uh, uh, at Lululemon what we uh, call the DEI aspect. So we've, uh, like Jaya mentioned, during the BLM movement, it was a catalyst for us to relook really at how are we organized and structured in this whole aspect. And we defined uh, and came up with this uh, idea. It's mm -hmm. inclusion, diversity, equity, and action, where we envision a world equitable uh, and inclusive of all. Uh, and that is very important for us. And we've taken that, and it's just not a standalone program or a standalone team. It's weaved into every aspect of business function. And I think at the round table before this, we were talking about it's not just about looking at numbers or benefits and things. It's really about uh, where we've gotten to in the world today. And yesterday, someone was talking about Gen Z and what they uh, uh, look for, right? I think there's more conscious consumerism. What's the social impact we're creating? Uh, what's inclusion? So inclusion is just beyond diversity. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's how do you create that sense of belonging even when you have that diversity. We brought that as well here when we started India operations just one and a half years ago. We have technology team. We have about 250 people now. So I think, personally, I think that should be inclusion and not just look at business benefits. But there are business benefits. <laughs> So a few, to, there's probably tons of business benefits. A few to mention is, especially during challenging times, you want access to different perspectives, different viewpoints, and that's what drives critical thinking and innovation. You want that because, uh, you know, you want to come out of the tough times, so it becomes even more imperative. The second one is if you build that psychological safety and create conditions for diversity to thrive, you're automatically creating retention. Absolutely. You want that for your organization. And the other one I can think of is, uh, of course, uh, I mean, we all have different terminologies, different organizations. So we call our clients as guests. Uh, and during those tough times, you, as guest uh, uh, base is expanding, you want a better idea of the different diverse groups of guests that, mm -hmm. you know, you haven't, and tapped into, so that's important. If you're not gonna have that if you don't create that diverse uh, talent pool. And the last one is really strengthening your uh, uh, reputation in the market. You don't want to be known as a brand or you want to be known as a brand who stand up for their values and not just uh, you know numbers and things. And it becomes easier for you to recover or get back into the market um, after the recovery. So that's... Yeah, thank <laughs> you so much, Praveen. Can I just add yeah, to yeah, a little bit of what you were saying? And completely, I think psychological safety is today imperative, right? To engagement, to retention, to wellness. So they say that organizations that focus on belonging, psychological safety, wellness, 
health, mental well-being, all of those are elevated, right? And there's research to prove all of this. My view is really around the fact that today, again, like I say, people who are listening today might be at different points in the DEI journey. You have to be able to have a DEI leader who has a seat at the table as a business leader to be able to sit with business and ideate for strategies for success. So it cannot be a tick in the box. So for those of you who have DEI as part-time roles, you know, you're doing a business role and a DEI role, you're doing a talent role and a DEI role. The first thing you need to shift and change is have somebody leading DNI full time. And somebody who that person needs to have a seat at the table in all business decision making. Thank you, Jaya. Um, so it's interesting, right? Praveen talks about conscious consumerism as a business leader. Praveen is talking about it's important for our world today and our society. And Jaya is talking about the impact that it, um, it brings to our business. The narrative has changed. Today, business leaders are a lot more conscious about the impact that they're not only creating within their organizations for their customers and their investors, but they're also looking at the impact that they are creating for society at large. And it blends perfectly in your overall ESG strategy as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, Jaya, moving on to you. What are some of the potential risks or pitfalls organizations should be aware of if they lower their investments in DEI in a cost-intensive environment, and how can these risks be mitigated? So, you know, when you talk about being cost-competitive in today's market, right, if you're going to lose the best of your people because you have a very non-inclusive culture, you're going to be spending triple the amount just rehiring for the best people you've lost or the investment you've made over the years. And for us, making inclusion real is starting off right at the bottom, which is people don't even understand what inclusion truly means or inclusive behaviors mean. So we have six inclusive behaviors, six principles we explain to our people don't listen to the loudest voice on the table. Give everybody an opportunity to speak up. You know, tap into your talent pool to ensure that everyone has a different aspiration. Have you tapped into that aspiration? I think inclusive behaviors are extremely important, not only in terms of just being able to, you know, practice, influence, but hold leaders accountable. So if there's anyone leaving you because they've said they were not included or they felt excluded or there was, you know, large insider-outsider dynamics, you need to check, check in and see what's not working. Bystanders, right? There's something not working. There's a non-inclusive comment. There's a micro-aggressive comment. And nobody stands up and says anything. How are you? correcting those behaviors? How are you holding people accountable? I think all of these are really, really important. So one is the investment you've made over the years in DNI, if you're just starting out. Two is the accountability of leaders and of every single person. Because I always say this, DEI is not a DEI function or a business only imperative. It is each employee who is responsible for ensuring that you can have an inclusive environment and culture where everyone can thrive and succeed. Thank you, Jaya. Um, you spoke about allyship. You spoke about bystanders. And we are in Pride Month. And the importance of allies is one of the most critical things for people from the Cure or the LGBTQ plus community. We all bring multiple identities to the workplace. I'm a woman, but there are multiple other identities that I have, and so do all of us in this room. Acknowledging these different identities becomes very, very critical because homogeneity is a big risk to business today. Moving over to you, Praveen. According to Deloitte Insights Poll, 57% of consumers 
are devoted to brands that promise to address social inequity, something you spoke about, social consciousness, such as by prioritizing diverse suppliers and focusing on hiring and retaining diverse talent. What role does leadership play in driving DEI efforts during challenging times? And how can leaders effectively communicate the importance of DEI to their people? 100% uh, agree. <laughs> leadership plays an important role. All our leaders, activated leaders, very important to drive inclusion. If you take a step back, I think one, to Jaya's point, you mentioned, uh, organizationally, I think that investment is needed to even understand what are these idea practices, what are the idea toolkits. If someone like Jaya, we have Stacia Jones, who is a global idea leader for Lululemon. If she and her team doesn't exist, we don't know how to operate, right? And that's very important. I think that's step one. Uh, do we have the right hiring practices? Have we weaved in the idea lens into those hiring practices where we are attracting and we have internal governance models, that's important. Our performance compensation, everything is structured to attract, retain and motivate the right leaders, I think who should share the values of what we're trying to do. And it's beyond just the organization, right? It's, it's the social impact that we want to create. And the second one is, yeah, we have all these leaders. End of the day, I'm a leader, I'm a human. <laughs> so I don't know everything, right? So how do we activate these leaders uh, with the practices and access to the toolkits and, uh, uh, and training, L&D? That learning and development, I think, is very crucial. Very recently, what we did is for our India team, we. Uh, the, uh, uh, the aspect of it's no longer cultural competence, it's cultural humility. So cultural competence talks about, uh, oh, I can become an expert in a mm -hmm. different culture, mm -hmm. which is not my own lived experience, right? So it's no, no longer that case. Intersectionalities are complex. Idea is definitely complex and transformative. So in this evolving diversity, intersectionality, uh, uh, the cult concept of cultural humility is really about, I'm not the expert, you're the expert, let me lean in, let me understand, and, and being in that posture, I think will really lead to designing more inclusive solutions and drive inclusion, right? Uh, so that's important. And the last one is collaboration. We have leaders and if they don't share those values, and we haven't really motivated them that way. Uh, just a plug here. <laughs> I have my tech leadership team, idea market leader, uh, PNC person. I, I think it's this collaboration coming together is what really helps us uh, to lean on each other and drive inclusion. Uh, one of the things that we are working uh, uh, recently is with RTO. Uh, uh, and I think it's very popular in the market for companies to provide their transport solutions and services. Uh, one of the philosophy at Lululemon is uh, when life works, work works. Uh, so the, 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 which leads to design your day to be most inclusive. You're not coming at nine and leaving at five. Mm -hmm. It's not that culture. But then, okay, with return to office, how can we still continue with that culture What's the inclusive solution here? So we're still working on that. We don't have a solution, but, but I think that collaboration is what drives such yeah. to be in that practice. Yeah. Those are great points, and yeah. I just, just a quick tip. We mm -hmm. have a system in place which we say is evaluate everything that you do from a preference, tradition, or requirement. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you talk about design your day, Right? There yeah. are so many deeply embedded stereotypes yeah. about what your day should look like. And I think if you look at it from a preference, tradition, requirement, philosophy, mm. you'll be able to do a lot with just being able to navigate through what is an ideal day for you might not yeah. be an ideal day for Good me. Point. So I also think that you were talking about culture, you were talking about values. You know, what are you rewarding in your organization in terms of values and behaviors? Are you rewarding compassion? Are you rewarding 
empathy? Are you rewarding emotional intelligence? Are you rewarding, you know, a support system or people who are, or leaders who are very supportive? Those are very important absolutely, conversations absolutely, today. Absolutely. And absolutely. if you're not rewarding those behaviors, not recognizing those behaviors and putting them out there for people to emulate, yeah. it's, it's really a loss. Absolutely. Yeah. And leaders exhibiting those behaviors become so, so important. Um, you know, during the pandemic and post that, vulnerability was something that was such a strength that is seen in leaders today. And um, I often talk about how when you look at leaders, you feel like leaders can never go wrong. Leaders do not make mistakes. Um, leaders cannot be vulnerable. And that comes from a very age-old notion seeped with patriarchy, and that narrative is changing today. And I'm hoping that DEI helps change that narrative. One thing that has helped leaders is reverse mentoring. Being mentored by someone from underrepresented or marginalized community really helps leaders understand their lived experiences. But I liked what you said is a philosophy in Lululemon. What is it? It was when life works. Yeah, it's, it's a very common thing. Life works, work works. <laughs> work yeah. works, wonderful. And all our lives are so different. Yeah. Um, do we have, I don't think we have time for another question. So can we conclude and then take questions if there are? Yeah, any closing comments? I think just some, you know, some, um, you know, aha moments for me for having practiced as a DNI practitioner and as a leader. Don't let go of accountability of all of your people on DNI, whether it's your leaders, whether it's you know your organization. Yes, we've all talked about the fact that we need to evaluate, and you have to have numbers in place, and you're tracking them all the time. But don't get lost in the numbers. Also, when we're talking about DNI, we're talking about diversity from a lens beyond gender. But remember, if you take your eye off the ball on gender, you will lose steam. So don't forget to make sure that gender is, is a key priority for you and continues to be because that is the first dipstick or the health of your organization. I don't know how many of you over here can raise your hands and say your leadership diversity or your representation is above 30%. Anyone? <laughs> That's fantastic. You're doing a great job. So I think that Having an opinion about what's going on in the world as an organization, you know, we're talking about polarized environments, we're talking about the ups and downs of the market, we're talking about cost competitiveness, we're talking about generative AI. I think always ensure that your culture is held tight in terms of just respect and being a good human being. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I would just like to say it's a culture. I think brave, building that strong culture is key to inclusion. End of the day, it's just one simple thing to remind ourselves. I think it's in each one of us. It's just be human for humanity. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Such a wonderful thing. Thank you. Um, I think next time someone asks that question, it should be how many people from the people with disability community do we have in the leadership team? How many people from the cure community do we have in our leadership teams and beyond and the multiple intersectionalities? So, um, and with that, I'd like to close. I think uh, it's very important organizations walk the talk, understand the importance DEI brings to their business and the transformation it will bring not only within their organizations, but to the world at large. Thank you. For more content on tech and leadership, subscribe to NASCOM YouTube channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update.